Hey folks, if you're a fan of the macabre or metroidvanias, you're in luck, since today I'm covering the Game Kitchen's recently released sequel, Blasphemous 2, a title which has been hinted at ever since the original hidden ending before its later confirmation. Still, the question remains, was Blasphemous 2 a sinfully solid sequel, or was Game Kitchen's follow-up half-baked? I'm your host Arlian, let's find out together. For a thousand long years, the lands of Custodia has been free of the grievous miracle, that phenomenon which had twisted prayers into profanity, liberated all due to the sacrifice of the penitent one, until something changed. Over the city of the blessed name, a massive heart formed, a sign of things to come, like a wretched infestation. The mark of the miracle spread through the lands, warping those that touched into shadows of themselves, deformed by their devotion. Worst of all, this is merely a taste of things to come, because a new child of the miracle is soon to be born. Only through the intercession of a recently revived penitent one is there any hope of a future free of that foul and fickle faith. Though the journey will not be easy, given he's not the only one to be revived. In his path lies the Arch Confraternity, who will oppose him every step of the way. Premise aside, this does a great job of picking up the narrative from where Blasphemous' true ending left off. Specifically, the true ending C, which was based off of the final DLC for Blasphemous. Really, the only thing that might be brutal here for fans of the former game is the fact that the A Thousand Year Time Skip means you have outlived all of the original cast. Well, Chrysanta's back again, but not for very long given she proceeds to die in the first minute of the opening cutscene in order to establish how powerful the head of the confraternity Evertino is. Oof. Nonetheless, I still found myself appreciating the story as it progressed, as the overall writing is strong as ever and the voice acting certainly adds to its impact. Even with the few cutscenes that occur, I never felt like I was locked into unnecessarily long info dumps. That said, as far as the storytelling goes, the real star of the show was all the world building in auxiliary lore. If you were a fan of seeing and hearing about the twisted irony doled out by the Grievous Miracle in the first game, you'll have plenty of opportunities to witness its workings, whether it's by simply soaking in the world, actively engaging with the game's various side quests and how they resolve themselves, or reading all the bits of lore lodged within the items you acquire. It does a great job of incentivizing a player to dive as deep as they can into Custodia's world. Speaking of which, there is a lot to dive in, and Blasphemous 2 provides a bit more freedom on that front this time around. While this remains a metroidvania with some souls-like elements like its predecessor, the platforming and exploration elements feel much more pronounced this time around. In fact, once you get through the tutorial segment and the initial movement ability of the wall jump, you'll suddenly find yourself with a trio of directions you can travel to. While at a glance this might seem the same as the first game, it's not long until it branches even further, in large part because of the multiple weapons that are introduced at the start of the game. See. Blasphemous 2 changes things up considerably by allowing the player to choose between three distinct weapons at the start of the game. A heavy sensor that acts like an oversized flail, a pair of speedy rapiers, and a more balanced longsword. While this has an obvious impact on combat due to the unique movesets tied to each one, this choice also has an unexpected side effect of influencing how a player interacts with the exploration early on because those weapons also have exploration abilities tied to each one. For instance, the sensor can hit bells, which activate floating platforms or weaken certain doors. The twin swords can be used to zip between mirrors in a flash of lightning, and the long sword can be used to break down wooden platforms by diving from a large enough height. Essentially, what secrets you can initially engage with are partially dictated by this early decision, at least until you're reunited with the other weapons in the early game, at which point the game really flexes its chops by connecting those along with the other movement abilities you'll find to make some truly solid platforming and puzzle segments as you press forward. Segments, which I should mention, feel substantially less frustrating than their prequel-related peers given you no longer die instantly to spikes and the like, instead just losing a chunk of health. 
Here's the interesting thing about those weapons, though. They aren't actually locked behind bosses, but through exploring those regions. There's literally nothing stopping you from snagging those new items and then simply leaving to explore the rest of the world further and shore up secrets. In fact, I was able to collect all three weapons and then use the combination of their abilities to dive into an area meant to be tackled later and pummel its boss to acquire the double jump ability which I then used to clown on those earlier bosses I'd bypassed. This sort of freedom is honestly great, as it provides a lot of choice for a segment that takes up something like 40% of the game. That said, once you do get past this midway point, the game does guide you down a generally more linear route. Albeit still with some wriggle room to unlock new areas or secrets that have been previously inaccessible, incentivizing exploration all the same. Pair that with the fact that you can freely leave map markers, which you can even tweak to showcase what kind of secret you've missed, and things click together fairly smoothly insofar as backtracking. Admittedly, it does help that the game is not only porous due to the sheer amount of shortcuts built in, but also provides the players with a number of tools to hasten retreading their steps. The first one I encountered was a spell that warps players back to town, which helps to cut down travel time considerably. The second was the fixed teleport system that sends players between certain locations once found. The last option takes a bit more work, but once you progress far enough down a certain side quest, you gain the ability to just teleport between any save point, which is the most efficient option at the end of the day. Now, at this juncture, I've likely covered the exploration as much as I've needed to, so let's dive headlong into the combat and more specifically your options. And I have to say, it definitely feels like it's improved. The option of three distinct weapons definitely feels interesting since they all play out differently. The sensor, for instance, lacks a defensive skill, forcing players to focus on their evasion in order to find openings for its more ponderous attacks, while managing their fervor, read mana, in order to power it up at the right times. The twin swords have a block and parry, but they also have a charge mechanic that requires players to execute fights flawlessly or risk losing everything they've accumulated. Lastly, there's the longsword, with its own parry and a system that provides you a power-up at the cost of a hefty chunk of health. Honestly, given you make this choice early on without knowing too much about them, it can be a bit awkward to lock yourself into a weapon you don't wind up jiving with, but given you get access to the other two fairly early on, it won't be too long until you're freely swapping between whichever one suits the situation, a fact that certain platforming segments thoroughly take advantage of. What's more, while you may not initially enjoy a weapon, if you should find the hidden shrines associated with them, you can expand their skill tree and drastically change up how they play, providing some fairly significant motivation to increase your familiarity with the Penitent One's arsenal. Admittedly, I do wish I could have seen more of the skill tree before I locked myself in, especially since some of the skill tree notes are simply passives, like defense boosts. And this is important since you do have to be careful about what you acquire due to a quirk of this game's approach to customization. See, in order to increase your weapon's level, you need to acquire a limited resource known as Marks of Martyrdom. These can be accrued by exploring the world, by slaying bosses, and also by fighting enemies in a manner akin to leveling. That said, these resources are also shared with another character building aspect, so even if you're diligent, you'll still find yourself unable to upgrade everything until the very end of the game, often requiring you to focus your attention to some degree, and if you do not manage to, say, find all the ones scattered throughout the world, you are going to find yourself either having to miss out on certain skills, or what these are shared with, namely, the Altarpiece system. Essentially, Altarpieces provide the Penitent One with passive abilities, like affecting the damage of their attacks, causing them to slowly regenerate health, or more specialized options like allowing you to save some charge progress when you're hit while wielding the Twin Swords. Essentially, these take the role of the more interesting rosary beads that existed in Blasphemous 1, with the added bonus that pairing up certain altar pieces will provide unique bonuses ranging from extra damage, changing up your dodge, or even outright shifting how a weapon functions to a degree. Without any sort of hyperbole, I actually found them to be such a great reward for exploring the far end of the map and figuring out how to acquire some of these. 
Really, the only downside to them is that you need to go to the hub city in order to rearrange them, at least until the end of the game. Which, um, juxtaposes itself against the rosaries, which still exist, but are now almost uniformly defensive boosts. I mean, yes, there's a pair that boosts your tiers of atonement gain, see money, as well as how fast you accrue martyrdom seals, but realistically, they're just different flavors of defense which you can slowly equip more of. Spells, at least, are treated a lot better this time around, since there's still a plethora of useful options, which have now been divided between verses, less expensive spells, and chants, which are more expensive and generally harder hitting or fulfill very unique roles. Being able to equip one of each makes casting a lot smoother, and also, you can't stop me from just using Time Stop. There's just one thing here, an element that I've yet to mention that makes this whole spiel feel a bit awkward. Blasphemous 2 feels easier. Yes, you can still get murdered by enemies. In fact, I found myself killed more than once because you have very minimal recovery frames, allowing an enemy to just bottom out your health by walking straight into you while you're in a corner. That said, I found that I died considerably less over the course of my journey, and I really doubt that it's simply a matter of me having experience with Custodia. Perhaps it's the fact that you'll encounter a fair number of enemies that exist within the same family, functioning similarly enough that you've long adapted their antics. Maybe it's just the number of tools at your disposal, or the ability to bully enemies by stunning them, especially with the sensor. Whatever the case, the hardest segments for me were generally marked by battles of attrition, of hikes through areas I hadn't unlocked shortcuts or save points for yet. Well, that and the boss fights, these admittedly still slap and definitely rated among the high points of my journey. Not only do they have some decent patterns that I had to work to adapt to, but the multiple phases frequently required a bit of quick thinking to adjust to. That, or some posthumous reflection. Really, it's at this point that I need to give some special shoutouts to the second last boss, because they were hands down the most brutal encounter of the game, and a reflection of the sort of showdowns I'd been hoping for. In fact, these encounters were the primary moments where I stopped messing around and abusing Blasphemous 2's take on the guilt system. Which, right, so, the first Blasphemous had a Souls-like flavored death penalty known as guilt, which reduced your max fervor as you died, as well as your tier acquisition until you collected your ghost. Blasphemous 2's system works similarly on the fervor front, reducing as you die, but it actually boosts your tier and martyrdom seal generation rate. Which sounds absolutely fantastic on paper, just sacrifice casting to get a leg up on customization early on. Only, it doesn't just mess with your fervor. It also tanks your defense. While you can get an altar piece that halves that penalty, it's a noticeable hit to your survivability to the point that I found myself thinking twice about it on a number of encounters. Still, I always appreciate a solid bit of risk reward and the ability to be a glass cannon, given there's a few instances where you can get damage boost for being at high guilt was just really, really hard for me to ignore. But yeah, that sums up mechanics, so it's time to talk aesthetics, and normally, I don't have too much to talk about on a visual front. That said, there are a number of interesting details to tackle in Blasphemous 2, so let's start from the top. The first difference veterans of the game will notice is the way cutscenes are handled in game, as there are now fully animated sequences. That said, while this change is obvious, perhaps the most notable visual detail impacts the gameplay itself. While the overall world itself still looks gorgeous, if you were a fan of the executions in the first game, you may wind up slightly disappointed. A big part of this is because a fair number of enemies will share certain animations. This becomes especially noticeable once you realize that certain enemies fall within a similar type which extends not only to their executions, but their animations at large, which therefore means once you've seen a few of them, you have a very good idea of everything they're going to do beyond an additional AoE on some of their moves. That said, the boss designs do remain a fantastic element and something to look forward to. The Pendant One's combat animations are also solid, and on the audio front, I only have praise. Once again, the music is an absolute highlight of the experience, with a very expansive list of tracks encompassing the various areas of the game, as well as the boss fights. 
What's more, the game is fully voice acted with a very talented cast. So, if I need to boil this all down, I think on the whole, I enjoyed the sequel a lot, even more than its predecessor, at least insofar as the base content. Which, yes, my fingers are crossed for more updates in the same vein as the first game got. I will concede I really wasn't challenged quite as much as its predecessor when it came to the roster of basic enemies, and I do wish there'd been more variety. That said, I certainly can't fault the boss fights, which provide me some fairly memorable encounters. And hell, you do have the option to make the game harder for yourself if you want to, and you're even incentivized for doing so, such as when I walked into this boss fight debuffed out the wazoo, only to perfect him out of spite. Admittedly, this is in large part because this entry affords an extraordinary amount of flexibility in combat compared to the last title, offering a solid array of offensive options to choose from. Really, my only gripe with the Penitent One's arsenal is the fact that you're slightly punished if you want to swap between weapons during a fight, given that you lose progress towards both the Longsword and Twin Swords charge meters when you do, which more or less prevents you from having a more dynamic approach to combat. Combat. Still, whatever reservations I may have held on those fronts, the exploration, platforming, and puzzle solving feel substantially better this time around. That, and there's some nice quality of life changes where it's completely averted the necessity of constantly shuffling a number of exploration related relics between a limited number of slots in order to explore, because that wasn't fun. Narratively, I think this game did an excellent job of picking up where the last one ended and further fleshing out the world, and honestly just bringing things to a satisfying close. Altogether, I do think I can call this game a crit hit. It is a game that I feel you should play. Play, and at this juncture, I don't have a reason not to recommend this to anyone and everyone. Unless, of course, you're a bit squeamish, there's definitely a few things in here that veer into the grotesque side of things, and admittedly, if you really were hankering to be challenged quite in the same way as the first game, this may end up feeling like a bit of a letdown. That said, with all of the flexibility of the combat, I had a tremendously good time. Anywho, thanks for tuning in. If you have something to say, leave a comment. If you enjoy my efforts to create new indie reviews and interviews, hit subscribe and Bell. For a link to my Discord, the Crit Hit Cauldron, check the description. There's also a link to my Patreon if you want to see reviews early or just want to support the channel, and to my merch house for neat swag like the Crit Hit Coffee Mugs. That said, I'll catch you on the next episode of Crit Hit. Take care till then, folks.